Thank you all for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Rodney Piggott, president of the Tobago Writers Guild, and we're here in conjunction with the Tobago Library Services to bring you our August monthly lecture. And this one is going to be a panel discussion. Before we get started with all of that, I need to, I was elected to give you our safety and convenience for the library, the protocols. So in case of emergency, you'll go right out the door that you came in. There's only one door in, one door out. So you'll orderly, <laughs> starting with those at the back, uh, exit that door. Uh, security guards will be out there to direct you. Under no circumstances should you take the elevator if there's an emergency. If you need to use the restrooms, they are to my left, your right. This conversation that we're going to have this evening may tend to get a little bit passionate. There's no fighting. There's no throwing of water, no water bottles, any of those things. We will have a cordial discussion, no matter how passionate the uh, discussion may get. All right, so that is it for our safety and convenience uh, briefing. We will now go into our national anthem, and I will thank everyone for standing for the national anthem. And is Mr. Jesse Taylor with us as of yet? No? Okay. So that brings the pouring of the libation will be my responsibility at this time. Are we all familiar with the pouring of libations? Anyone who's not familiar with it? All right, it is not a religious practice, it's a cultural practice. It is our way of remembering our ancestors, those on whose shoulders we stand, our grandmothers, our great-grandmothers. Come on, you do want to say thank you to them for being here because it's because of what they did is the reason why we're here today. So it's a way of saying thank you to them. But first and foremost, we're thanking the Most High and we want to remember our ancestors on whose shoulders we stand. The call and response word is ashe. It's a key Swahili term. It simply means, let it be so. It's like saying amen when you're in church and you say amen after you pray, right? Same meaning, ashe. So the crowd will say ashe after the pouring of each libation. This is an interactive exercise. We do not want to disrespect our ancestors. So it's not a show. It's not something that, you know, you just don't pay attention to. 
give it the respect that it actually deserves. And so participating is mandatory, okay? So I will begin, and each time I pour libations, and libations, by the way, I, I know you've seen many um, hip hop videos where the youngsters are on the corner and they're pouring one out for the homie, right? That's their way of trying to remember what we used to do. They don't have it dong pat, but at least it's a way of them trying to remember what we do. Libation is used uh, by pouring alcohol. That's one of the central ways of doing it. But of course, when we're using a plant, we don't pour alcohol into the plant. We pour water, and the plant symbolizes the earth. So we're pouring water into Mother Earth, okay? I will ask that everyone stand for this, please. And to the Most High Creator, known by many names, but we know that there is only one, we say, Ashe. 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 To those of our ancestors who were before the Ma'afa, the so-called slave trade, those whose names we may remember and may not remember, the Imhotep, the Queen and Zingas, and so forth, we want to thank them for what they did for us in our journey, and we say, Ashe. For those of our ancestors who perished, suffered during the Ma'afa, or what's known as the transatlantic slave trade, those whose names we don't know, those whose bones are still at the bottom of the Atlantic, those who swung from trees and no one knew their names, no one to mourn for them. For those ancestors, we want to say, Ashe. And to our personal ancestors, those in our families, our great-grandmothers, our grandmothers, mothers, fathers, on whose shoulders we literally stand. And at this time, if you want, you can call out some of their names. I will start with uh, Harriet Piggott, Ashe. 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 And to those ancestors yet to come, because as Africans, we know that when a child comes into the world, it's an ancestor returning. So to those yet to be born, we want to say, Ashe, Ashe, Asheo. Okay. And often at this time, what we will do is we will normally go outside of the room and pour one for those of our ancestors who we say are disagreeable spirits. Because some of our ancestors were very disagreeable spirits. That's how they transitioned. And we would want to give them their acknowledgement also. All right? And for those, we say touche. So to those ancestors, we say touche. Touche. All right. Thank you very much. At right, this time, I'm going to bring your wonderful moderator to you. She is no stranger to, to you, the community, Ms. Deborah Moore Miggins also known to me as the people's attorney. Uh, I've known many of those. They're different from the uh, attorneys who only attend to high-ranking people. You know, these types of attorneys, yes, they have high-ranking clients, but they also look around at the man and the woman who don't have nothing in their pocket and will do whatever they can to help that person. We call those the people's attorney. Thank you, everybody. Welcome. And it is a sincere pleasure being here to do that mod moderation. And I certainly want to compliment the Tobago Writers Guild. Isn't this a great idea? And uh, to welcome particularly your young people, very proud and happy to see them there. Uh, we also wish to acknowledge Mr. Reginald Dumas, 
He's one of the patrons, the advisors, the think tank of our group, and we're happy that you can find the time to be here. Dr. James, likewise, thank you for coming. Everyone else, of course, your company is appreciated. Today we are talking about mental chains and how do we emancipate ourselves from them. And I make bold to say that many of us may know in what ways our minds are chained. Some may not know or some may not know all the different ways that our minds are chained. People point to several things. They point to the, the foods we eat, the foods that we had not traditionally eaten. Uh, and we have virtually abandoned those that we were eating and adopted those from other persons and as a result present some uh, you know, health issues for us that we are living with today and don't seem able to shake off those very foods. They talk to the bleaching of our skin. They talk to our educational system where we don't even know our history properly. They talk about the fact that we don't spend our money with our own people. We prefer to buy from others, whether it's online or whatever else. And I'm sure you will hear this several ways from our, our esteemed panelists that we can be said to be mentally chained. The challenge as a moderator that I would like to throw out is after we have spent some time on exposing some of those ways, the question is, how could we then embark on the process of emancipating our minds? That is the challenge. We need to know what we are up against, but certainly at the end of the day, when we leave here, can we come up with that process by which we can truly say we are attempting, because it's not easy. You all would hear from our moderators that that or from our panelists that it's not easy. But where do we go when we leave this? We have some of the most distinguished panelists this afternoon, and I am happy to introduce them. The first is Mr. Opuku Ware. Opuku, are you here? Yes, please come forward, sir. Next is Ms. Heather Gray. Then Mr. Kamau Akili. And then Ms. Laureen Boris Phillips. And as we have them here, I would like to just tell you a little more about each and every one of them. Mr. Opukuwari, he was involved in the revolutionary struggle for African redemption since 1969. He was arrested in 1970 for disturbing Her Majesty's peace, presidential to public safety, prejudicial, I should have known, Pre prejudicial to public safety and order. He was arrested in 1974 while campaigning to make August 1st a public holiday, be actually beaten by the police. He was arrested in 1982 for protesting against cultural injustice in Tobago. He has used several fora to highlight and advocate for the total redemption of African people home and abroad. Let us give him yet another applause. Ms. Heather Gray is a native of Tobago and proud to be born and raised in Delaford. She worked in the public service for a number of years, but always had a fervor for learning. She attained the BA degree, Bachelor of Arts, first class honors in psychosocial studies. She acquired an MSc in economics, in MSc econ in library and information studies. She managed operations at the Charlottesville Branch Library, and this experience 
embodied what it is to be a true community librarian and a true community library. And she brought into focus the roles and functions that a public library body is meant to play in the lives of individuals and the community as a whole. She has been very much involved in the library department's partnering and supporting community programs which are meant to foster community development. Let us again greet her. <laughs> Ms. Akili is a, has a certificate in education with distinction and a Bachelor of Education with first class honors out of the University of the West Indies. His past employment engagements are, he was a secondary school teacher and education administrator. He was a tutor for the Tobago Institute of Positive Education, which is remedial education. He was a founding member and executive director of Environment Tobago. He's a radio talk show host. At least he used to be Radio Tambrin. We haven't heard him for a little while. He's a sustainable development coordinator at the Tobago House of Assembly, and he's the advisor of the United Nations Environment Program, Integrated Watershed and Coastal Area Management in the Caribbean. Uh, his present employment, Rural Development Coordinator for Sustainable Communities in the Tobago House of Assembly, Sustainable Development Consultant, and he's the Deputy Chairman of the Eco-Industrial Development Company of Tobago, that's Eddie Cut and he also engages in subsistence farming. Ms. Lauren, Bo thank you, thank you. Ms. Lauren Boris Phillips has a degree in agriculture, upper second class honors degree from the University of the West Indies. She also has a master's degree in agricultural economics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She served in the Organization of Professional Women of Tobago in the 1980s. She also served in the Organization of Professional Women in Agriculture in Trinidad, that's in the 1990s. And she served in the Care Organization of the Church, which is visiting senior shut-in members and those who can't make it to church on Sundays. And she's a founding member of the Tobago Writers Guild from 2006, seven to present. She's a former Radio Tambrin talk show host and she does community work in various ways. Let us also welcome <laughs> Ms. Lauren Boris Phillips. So I think you'll agree with me that we are poised for a very, very um, inspiring afternoon, but also one that ha would have us thinking deep and certainly trying to come up with solutions as best we can. As moderator, I want to encourage each and every one of you to feel comfortable and participate to the best extent possible in this evening's exercise. So what we'll do, I'll start with our panelists. We're just gonna ask them to give us an idea, a synopsis as to what they will be presenting in perhaps four minutes, four to five minutes, no more each of them. But I also, at that point, want to get you or, part, or members of the audience participating from as early as that, so long as you recognize the time frame that I will impose. So we're going to ask you to tell us what, you, what touches you about this topic, what you really came expecting to hear, or any other thing that you want to share with us. We'll take about four persons then. Then we'll come back to our panelists who will then develop their points for about 10 to 15 minutes, each of them, or we can do two, take some more from the audience and do the next two. So I'll be, I'll be controlling and guiding. For now, let us ask our panelists in not more than five minutes to just tell us what the, how, what angle they will be coming from in their presentation. Is Ms. Boris Phillips saying, ask me first? Yes, yes, they keep putting me last. 
<laughs> All right, so special requests, I have no problem. We'll have Mrs. Boris Phillips, and she'll just give us that five-minute inter introduction. All right, today we are armed with the knowledge that we are resilient descendants of a people who were stolen, who were torn from, who were torn from their native land, robbed of their way of life, brutalized in the most awful way, etc. And we have to turn our minds now to the repair of that damage. Because remember, people will tell you, well, there was slavery all over the world. Why are they always quarreling? But we know the response to that. There was no other example of more than 300 years of chattel slavery and um, a system of social casting that put color as the, as, as the basis of it. And so we need to turn our minds now to that re-education. Uh, we know that slavery was our fate, but before that we must remember that we had a history before slavery. That is something I think we sometimes forget. We know that the origins of chattel slavery were economic. It was an economic decision to decide, well, we can't do all this work, we want somebody to do the work, and we don't want to pay them, so they did what they did. Uh, and when it was no longer economically viable. They decided that they did not wish to have slaves anymore. Um, we don't, of course, deny the existence of the abolitionists. There were people who were, you know, in favor of getting rid of the slave trade, so we do appreciate that, but just know that the principal decision to end slavery was an economic decision. It's not that they were that nice, all right? Um, we, I have a quote here from uh, Dr. Selwyn Carrington, who is a son of the soil. And what he said, and I got this from the book Eric Williams Speaks. Dr. Selwyn Carrington said, those people who ask the people of the African diaspora to forget learning about their past and about slavery should think again. It is a request to deny us of our history and hence our future. Will these men ask the Jews to forget the Holocaust. And I don't know about you, but I am a movie fan, and I remember that inter I remember at intervals we get another Holocaust movie. The last one was Schindler's List. Then before that, it was Sophie's Choice. And then before that, it was The Diary of Anne Frank. I know all of them, I went to see them. Okay, so they do not let their people forget. They do not let the world forget. But we must shut up, okay? Mm -hmm. So, we are at the stage where we can look to the future, but we must acknowledge the damage, the trauma to our people as we go forward. And as Mahatma Gandhi said, you may never know what results can come from your activities. You'd never know what the fruit will be, because we may not live to see that. But if we do nothing, we know that there will be no results, no fruits at all. So it is our business as people of African descent and all the other kinds of peoples because slavery affected all the people who were involved eh, in different ways. It is our duty to start the conversation in the hope that as we pass on, as we will, the conversation is going to be continued with our younger people. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters, or ladies and gentlemen, if you prefer. Uh, my thesis this evening is, is very simple. The argument is that African slavery has practiced in the Caribbean, in the Americas, had a tremendous psychological impact on the individual and the collective. An impact that changed significantly the belief systems of these individuals. The belief system or the worldview of the individual is what determines their values, their, their attitudes, their, their behavior, everything. And if you impact that belief system, then you change the culture of the individual. And the African was subjected to such trauma. In fact, in modern studies, it is referred to as um, cultural trauma, and the belief is that that trauma was transmitted. The changes in the culture, the changes in the worldview were transmitted 
from one generation to another. Culture is learned. The individual is born with what you call a tabula rasa, a clean slate. And you learn by mimicry, by instruction. In teaching, we talk about the hidden curriculum and so forth. And the African slave would have been exposed to a type of treatment and forced to accept a value system that was based on the European belief. In other words, the values were determined to a great extent in terms of whiteness. To the extent that blackness was seen as something wrong. So you had the African developing an, a crisis of identity that has come down to the present era. And we could look at ways in which this is expressed. We can look at ways of how the African was forced into adopting these value systems of the Europeans. A lot of us may believe that you can try to change a man, but you can't change his or her mind. That is not so true. There's something called conditioning, by which you can force changes in the thinking and the belief of an individual. We can develop conditioned reflexes. Because of our experience, we do things and we don't even understand why we do these things because of that conditioning. But as a result of that conditioning, we can develop certain values, certain behavior that are passed on to our children and our grandchildren. And I, my thesis is that has happened to us to bring us to where we are here today. And later on, I can go into some of the ways in which the African would have been traumatized during that experience of slavery. The question has been asked, how do we repair this? What do we do? This is something that has been looked at for more than 50 years now by black uh, scholars. You had people like Franz Fanon of Martinique, a psychiatrist, was one of the first who looked at the issue of the traumatization and the psychological impact of enslavement. And you had Paulo Freire in Brazil who looked at how can we re-educate ourselves? And he has spoken to an approach to what we call critical consciousness, becoming self-aware, trying to understand what we do, how we do it, but most important, why we do it. And it is something that we can develop, and it is something that we can teach to our children. Thank you. My approach, my opening statement would be slightly different because um, we were just told to have an opening statement. So I um, constructed mine slightly different. So um, at this point, what I would say is um, in my effort to introduce my interest and desire to be part of this conversation, you, um, there, were, there was a question that occupied my mind throughout. And um, the question was, have I demonstrated generally enough evidence to warrant my being given this privilege? And I had two conflicting answers to that question. In one instance, it was no. If I was to measure, if my measure was an outward, was outward symbols of being you were centric, um, Afrocentric, sorry. But on the other hand, it was yes, if there was a valued place for a strong, confident, proud, and resilient black woman. And I think I am, no boasting. <laughs> so as you can see, I decided yes, and I assured myself that I was going to be useful here this evening. So at this stage, I want to um, just trace my interests and sensitivities to first my father, 
who no matter what stage he was in his life, he advocated black consciousness and saw that there was still so much work to be done. As a union official, he was always concerned with inequalities and seeking to empower the less privileged and interests that ran through our home. And then secondly, there was my uncle who lived in Trinidad and who was an integral part of my life. He was one of those who was influenced by the reclaiming of African identity movement that was very dominant at a time in our social history. As a youth, I witnessed him in his dashiki, beaded jewelry, engaging in craft of making leather sanders, shoes, bags, belts. He was a member of the Mau Mau Drummers, an African drumming um, orchestra, who performed with and Andre Tanker and the Mau Mau Drummers. Through him, I was exposed to the music of Fela Kuti, Hugh Masakela, Mano Dibango, Baba Mal, with some Miriam Makiba thrown in. As simple as this may seem, it engendered in me a natural and a normative approach and sensitivities to issues that are part of the discourse of race and racism. And so with this background, coupled with my later exposure to some of the theories that seek to explain us as human beings, I am here this evening to join in the discussions. Now, my approach to the topic was to structure it in asking questions of what, who, why, how, when, and so on. So as we uh, may to, um, offer the opportunity to expand, I will try to give you some of the, the points that came out as I asked those questions. So I hope we would have an a, a interesting experience and one that is um, collaborative where we can discuss and, and talk to each other. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good, good day to one and to all. I want to focus on Africa before the intervention of the Arabs and the Europeans. I want to focus on the glory of Africa, the Africa that stunned the world with its civilizations. The Africa, when the first Europeans went down to Africa, who say, oh, the land where men walk like gods. The glory and the civilizations that Africa gave to the world is one of the most monumental contributions in the history of humankind. And that was thousands of years before the slave trade. Thousands of years before the birth of Jesus Christ. Uh, that was the Africa which gave the concept of one God to the world. Three in one, one in three, peace on earth, goodwill toward all men, was spoken by the African Akhenaton 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. So I want to deal with, focus part of the discussion on that. I want to deal with the Arab invasion of Africa because it was the Arabs who invaded Africa because of envy and jealousy and weakened the African nation structure, scattered the African nation to the point that made it easy for the Europeans to come in after in the 14th century and so on. Also I want to focus on those, um, the resistance to invasion and the occupation of Africa. And focus on some of the heroes of that resistance movement, like Queen Nzenga of Southern Africa, Mozambique, Angola, who defeated the, the Portuguese seven times. I want to focus on Shaka Zulu, who was the only man to, do, to, uh, to break the British military formation called the Four Square. It was a military force formation that the British Army had that no other opponent could have um, broken. And Shaka Zulu invented a mili military strategy to smash that Four Square. Also, I want to focus on uh, 
the resistance against uh, enslavement because the, the, uh, the African did not humble and just surrender. They fought and they fought valiantly uh, in Africa and in the Caribbean. You know, um, uh, you know, we have said it so many times that even in Tobago, um, Tobago reported um, so many times against Charles Levy, 1770, 1771, 1775, 17, uh, 1776, 1796, 1802, 1805, 1824, 1822, and so on, you know? Even after Charles Levy, there were more uprisings by Africans. So th those, and, and those, and the individuals, some of the individuals involved in those, uh, e the events, I want to focus on that. Also, on um, other important events like after emancipation, like the, the rise of the Butler Movement, and what was the role of Tobago within the Butler Movement? Remember Butler was charged for sedition. Don't forget that. Um, also, forget we, wanted we must deal with 1970, which was one of the, it was the most important and greatest act of emancipation and freeing up of the African mind in Trinidad and Tobago in our lifetimes. So we must deal with that and, uh, and so on. So and as we go along, it will become more beautiful as the afternoon progresses. I would throw out to the floor and I would take about three or four persons to just share with us what are the expectations? What are some of your thoughts? What would you like to see come out and, and what can you yourself contribute? Regrettably, I can only give you three minutes each before we get back to our panelists to do their full presentation. Yeah, good afternoon for some people who have not known me. I'm Leslie Bigat, up among St. George, where I live in Lowlands. I have heard the various panelists, and I want to make a suggestion about um, emancipation. Now, we had the Tobago Writers um, Guild that have commenced this um, uh, forum this afternoon. I would like to have them work in collaboration with the Tobago House of Assembly and the private sector. They should adopt an initiative that can surely facilitate the continued awareness and education over time about our invaluable history of emancipation with regard to our Tobago and Trinidad people in the homes, in the schools, in the communities and in the churches. That's my contribution. Hi, good evening. My name is Juliet James. Um, I just, well, I have other things to say when the panel discussion starts. I just wanted to uh, congratulate the Writers Guild for taking the opportunity to have a series of discussions from now and all the others in the past that I've been to. I appreciate it, and I want to say that there was a time there was no space for discussions like these, unlike other places I've been to or lived for short periods of time. There was always vibrant discussions, educating people, letting people know about their history, talking about Caribbean history, Caribbean development. So I really appreciate the effort that the Writers Guild has taken I want to challenge the Guild, however, to take the discussions to the schools. As a student, I was exposed to discussions from all kinds of persons. Lectures from Pujubantan, lectures from um, Cartel, all kinds of people. And it opens your mind in different ways. And I would like persons who are younger than me to have that experience from the Writers Guild using the resources that we have here, the human resources that we have here, and take it to the schools. You'd be surprised when you go into the schools. You wouldn't get a full room, but it, it will have students who would come to the discussions, who would want to hear you talk, who would want to also express their views and learn more. 
And it should be done not when school has closed, but when school is in session. So that's a challenge I want to put out to the Writers Guild. It should be a roving body. I am Irene Beach. And I want to say, whenever I hear the word community, it rings a bell. So I will be keeping my antenna up for any program that represents the community. I want to share with you that we have 36 villages and communities there. So we have skills and talents that will benefit those 36 communities out there. Thank you. My name is Ryan Allard. Thank you very much to the committee. Thank you very much to the, the Writers Guild for organizing the event today. I'm very excited about it. And to the panel, I'm really excited about hearing your perspectives and to stimulate the discussion. I thought, however, we could start with um, more of a definition of what is mental slavery, as well as a, de a definition about what is emancipation, a mental emancipation. Because I think it's a very amorphous concept right now. In our mind, everybody in here probably has two or three different meanings of what those words could mean to them personally. And I think having that free in the discussion would be a lot more insightful for each of us. So for instance, if we think about um, what may be a pattern of behavior that, as you said, Ms. Morgan, Ms. Ms. Uh, Ms. Miggins, the pattern of behavior about what, what triggers your thought, what triggers your action without you even realizing it, that might be a mental slavery, but a form of mental slavery, and maybe at least bringing it out into the open, that could be something that we discuss. Um, another side of that would be, is the word emancipation, does it generally mean to people, does it automatically mean linking back to Africa? Is that the definition of emancipation that we're using today? Or is it something else? For instance, is it highlighting our Africanness, Or is it somehow highlighting our Caribbean-ness? What, what is the balance between those two that you see as emancipation? So I hope that we can get into the more discussion about the definition that we use to feed the discussion. Thank you very much. All right, so we have different requests from people. One is for our definition of the, the term mentally, mental emancipation. One is a challenge as to how do we um, marshal some of what we have, uh, what is coming here and generally from those who um, perhaps have a contribution to make, how does one extract that? We have one who said, can we go into the schools? Uh, and those panelists are the kind of thoughts that are coming out of your, your audience today. Now, I know you have come prepared with your um, presentation, and we want to give you that opportunity now. But to the extent that you can incorporate or respond to some of the, the comments from the floor, that would also be very, very um, welcome. Let me get, be clear, I do not have a presentation. I spent a lot of time reading around this topic because it, I, I, history is one of my enthusiasms. So of course, I just went to my library and I pulled down the relevant books and okay, so Okay, but the thing is, eh? One of the reasons, perhaps, so why you might find we have not, in fact, defined emancipation and the mental slavery is because we would have had a previous lecture, and in our minds, we thought we might have dealt with that. But, but you are correct. We should have established that before we started any kind of discussion here. All right? And we, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. We in, I interpret emancipation as the time the, when the slave trade was abolished and uh, then after the Afoya apprenticeship system, when people of African descent who had been held illegally and wrongly as slaves were allowed to run their own lives for themselves. There were all kinds of other things we could talk about in that time where the slave owners, the plantation owners, who were participants in the crime were compensated to the tune of 20 million pounds and the so-called free slaves found themselves all of a sudden off the plantation, they're free. But they have no means of generating income, they have no land, they have no, well, some of them might have had skills, but they had nothing to start them off. 
to give them a chance, to give them an opportunity to develop themselves, to give them an opportunity to survive. So many, quite a few of them ended up working again on the plantations. Some people um, in Tobago, I believe, some people had some access to land, and so they were able to go on the land keep planting and selling their stuff and so develop a, develop a, a measure of freedom. But the emancipation that we have in mind, I think, is what would have occurred after slavery was abolished, after the ap apprenticeship system, and people were allowed to, if you want to walk down the road there, you could walk down the road there. So that is what we saw as emancipation. The whole business of mental slavery is something that it's very, very difficult to really understand the depth of that. Because if you take people away from their natural environment, the place they know as home, where their grandfathers, their grandparents, and so buried, and what we used to say in, we say in Tobago, where you're navel string buried. And you, you remove from them all contact with these, this place. You brutalize them to the extent that they cannot even develop family ties because your child could be sold away from you anytime your wife could be raped in front of you anytime your daughter could be raped in front of you anytime what does that do to your mind what kind of a violence is executed on your mind for you to get over that and then you know and i'm speaking as if it were a man you now have to be a father okay but you are encouraged to have children all over the place because massa wants his sleep pen filled do you see any parallels, sir? The way in Tobago, and let me point out, I am a Boris. People have children after children after children after children just to be able to boast on the block to say that I have 14 children. You can neither support them financially or emotionally. That is, a, that is mental sleep. That is mental sleep. The only way you can see yourself expressing yourself as a man is to have children all over the place from Charlottesville straight down to Canaan Bonacord. Okay? Mental slavery. You look at yourself in the mirror and decide that that face that God give you, it ain't right. It's too black. Okay? So you're buying bleach cream. You're buying bleach cream. The melanin that the good Lord put in our skin for hotter climates with more sun protects us from the sun. So you are deliberately stripping your skin and they know you're afraid. You can't go out in the sun unless you plaster on a set of makeup. Mental sleep. And this is a painful one that I, but I'm going to see it. When you see somebody with my color, which is not a true African color, eh? African people from the part where we come from, we black. When you see people with lighter skins, what do you think that's shouting at you? What is it shouting at you? That is the rape of your race. How else you get lighter skin? That is how the plantation owner executed his property rights on women. So then you have a set of different colored children and then to make sure you grind it into them, you let them know, well, you have a little white blood in you, so you're better. So if you don't have any white blood at all, you're not good at all. And we have bought into that. We have all bought into that. All of us, okay? And it is a struggle, it is a struggle that we will all have for the next 100 years because you're not going to get over 300 plus years of slavery in one year or two years or three years. This discussion has to take, continue long after I have gone on, on to my ancestors, okay? Long after some of you have gone on. But the discussion must continue. And this is why I appreciate the number of young people that Mrs. Lawrence Solomon drag out her whole Utah Tobago group and say, well, you know, she's that kind of person. All you, they having this thing, come. Come. Okay? So they are all there. Because it is a discussion that has to be gone. So I am not going to take up any more time. I just attempted to try and answer the young man's question. I want to, to say I do appreciate the suggestion about the school um, interventions. It is not that we have not tried before, madam. It is not that we have not tried. But we will continue to try. We will continue to try. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. What do we, what do we think? Yes. Yes. 
I think we're getting into the meat of the matter. And we, we need to bear in mind too what the, the question Junior has asked and the question Mr. Bigot has asked. So let's, let's know, I don't know which one of our panelists would want to respond. First you present your, your, pre your pre prepared um, statement and to the extent that it responds to some of the concerns, we'll appreciate that. Well, I want to start off first by dealing with the concept of emancipation. And that may lead into some of the other stuff that I want to say. Now, you would have had a legal definition of emancipation. You had legal enslavement, which was the law allowing one person to own another person. Straight up. To be able to sell a person or buy a person. To be able to punish a person in ways that were terrible, even to the point of killing that person without consequences. And I would, could give a little example of that. We would have had a lot of slave laws. For example, uh, in the United States, you had the Constitution of 1787, Article 1, Section 1, which states that for the purpose of determining the population of a state in the United States, a slave was considered three-fifths of a person. In the Danish islands, the slave regulation of 1773 says enslaved laborers who committed grand larceny or who encouraged others to escape were to be pinched three times with a red hot iron tongs and then hanged. If you try to run away, you would have your leg amputated. Or if your master forgave you to get 150 lashes and lose one ear. You had similar laws in Barbados starting from 1651. The first attempt to run away would be a, a flogging and branding of the face and slitting of the nose. Of course, the second attempt to run away would be punishable by death. Any slave who struck a white person in Barbados for whatever reason could be punished by amputation, cutting off hand or foot or whatever, or be hanged, simply for striking a white person, for whatever reason. And there were no consequences to the white person or the owner who would have executed that slave. So we tried, we, we tried to establish the legal situation in which the African found himself or herself as property of someone. So just as you have a cow or a dog and you want to do anything you want to do with it, that was the situation in most instances for the African slave. And that was legal slavery that was ended um, between 1834 and um, 1850 in different countries in the Caribbean. But having said that, there was another aspect of oppression, which was colonial rule. And sometimes you didn't know where the actual oppression and the plantation started and where colonial oppression continued. So whereas the African would have been freed physically, in other words, he was no longer the property of somebody. When he was freed, he wasn't given land, he wasn't given a house, he had nowhere to go. Uh, if you listen to Sparrow Calypso Slave, you would, and you listen to the lyrics, uh, Sh Sparrow would tell you what would have happened to the slave when he was freed. Treated like a vagabond, nothing, nothing at all to survive on. So he still had to depend on the plantation to some extent to survive, and his labor continued to be exploited. But that is the legal emancipation, the physical. Legal slavery, legal emancipation. But there's the issue of mental slavery. And to my mind, 
Mental slavery is the result of one's value systems being compromised. The African would have left Africa with a certain value system. He came to the Caribbean and he was forced to see things as the slave master wanted to see. The first thing that happened to the African is that he was stripped of his religion. Under the, the French code Noir, for example, the first thing that was to be done to an African slave when he arrived in a French colony, Martinique, Guadeloupe, wherever, he was to be baptized in the Roman Catholic faith. A master who did not do that within one week was subject to punishment and possible losing his slave. And any attempt by any African to practice any religion that was not Roman Catholic was considered seditious. And if they persisted with it, it was punishable by death as sedition. So you have a situation now of the African having to adopt the value system of his oppressor. And in a sense now, being forced into what you call an identity crisis. You've been told that being black is inferior. Anything a bad is associated with your color, black. Black like sin. And I can go into some of the hymns that would have been taught to us to, for us to believe that white is purity and white is whatever. And blackness is something to be despised. When we start believing that, whether totally or in part, that is mental enslavement. Because we are now operating according to the value system of the oppressor. He doesn't need to put chains on our hands anymore. We ourselves, we become our own enslavers to some degree. And Franz Fanon would have pointed out to this problem of the black man and the, 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 the double identity that we, crisis that we are faced with. Because some of us have found ourselves in a place where we so want to adopt the system of the, the white man, the oppressor, that our measure of success is the, the trappings, the status symbols that the white would associate us with success. So speaking the Queen's English to us is critical, very important. And if somebody speaks dialect, which is a mix of African and English, oh, they, they bad. They, 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 yeah. They're uncultured. Bad English. I don't know how many of you remember, I, I remember it in growing up. We go into, in front of our front door, you have this nice picture hanging above the front door. Remember that picture? A nice white Jesus with a sacred heart and blue eyes and so forth. That was to protect the house. Right? An example of us black people looking to something that is not of us as our or protector, or and we can go on and on to point out the, the, the various ways in which um, how we adopt some of the values. I remember my grandmother had in a living room a wagonette. You know the wagonettes with the china wear in it. Fancy china wear costing plenty money in, in their days. White people think 
When she wake up in the morning, she using an enamel cup or something to, to drink her tea. But that swaggerness and so on, because that is how the white people just keep the things. Once a year, she would open up the wagonet, take out the china, wash it gently, daintily clean. Dare you not break one. And put it away. I have never seen her use that for over 30 something years until she passed out of this earthly life. That is an example of how we have been enslaved in terms of our beliefs, which shape our values, which shape our attitudes, and in turn shape our behavior. And it, it extends today in all different spheres. You see it with our politicians. As soon as a guy gets into office, what does he want? You want a black car, right? With a two number of the latest series that says that I have arrived. Because that is what they have in England and Trump drives around in a big limousine and the Queen drives around in a big limousine, so. Not, don't mind that the country is poor like, right, and we can't afford it. Another example, and the Saville suits that some of us spend thousands of dollars for. That's hot like hell to wear outside in our climate. But that is the symbol of success in terms of a black man in our society. Um, I want to also focus certain questions have come to me. Someone is concerned about the education system as it um, exists in Trinidad and Tobago. Do we see any issues there in terms of uh, African children going to school and many of us coming out without that knowledge of our African history or African heritage? So that's one of the questions. Another has to do with reparation, where we haven't gotten there as yet. Um, but Akili, as you spoke about our dress, I want to bring into focus that archaic rule that prevents people from going into government buildings with armhole, with armless, with short pants, with the works, I mean, that is something right in your face that when we leave here tomorrow, if people wanted to change that, we can. And, you know, there should be an immediate demand about that. I am in, the, in Florida a couple months ago, and I'm waiting for someone who went to do some business at licensing. And there were people moving in and out, busy. And all shades of people dressed in any ways they want to. Slippers, sleeveless, anything. And they go in, they do their business. Nothing more professional than those people in there. So professional. They don't even look at what you have on. But here we have people telling you, you can't go past the desk, the security unless you go back home and put on all these kinds of things. And what a friend of mine pointed out to me, she was one, she had on, she wears big baggy short pants. And as she was stopped there, she saw one of the workers, young girls, going up her skirt right up here. And she passed and walked in and she turned to the security when you could tell her not to go in, I wouldn't go in and she just walked past. So that is something that, as I said, we can attack as soon as possible. You touched on my, you, you matched my tone when you spoke about education, because I would like to put the question to the panel and to the audience. If you are saying, oh, we're not taught our heritage, um, but aren't we deliberately taught West Indian history in school? In addition to that, every year, when uh, we have the Tobago Heritage Festival, isn't that supposed to speak to our history and our heritage? How does it relate 
to this idea of mental could, slavery. Could I answer a question that he asked? Right. You mentioned about the education system. What was the question? Could you repeat? Right. Um, Mrs. McGinn's was saying that we. Uh, yes. All right. He was talking about the history of our schools, what have you. I, I have retired, right? Prior to retirement, I had been teaching history and other things that I would hear people say that the education system doesn't cater for many things that happen in our society. That is not so. The, 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 the structure of the, the social studies syllabus, it is multidisciplinary. So the onus is on the teacher to take a topic and break it down into many things that would affect it that we, that we do in society. So if it is not done, we have to blame it on the teacher. All right? I know we slavery and all that, but the, the damage started really what sank, sank in really with the colonial administration and the same education system. Because it was Carter Woodson who said, um, when you control a man's thinking, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry about his actions. And as Caribbean people in Tobago, Trinidad and the rest of the Caribbean, they formally taught us how not to think. They formally um, because the, the education system that they left us was for social control, right? Come back to the time when nobody in Tobago or Trinidad was able to uh, have any senior position in any ministry and so on as a white person. And it, you can't blame the teachers because they were part of the conditioning. So the, the system was handed down through the years. Go back to school, primary school, oh Mary, go and call the cattle home. Some girl in Scotland, we, the, the widest river in Tobago is about four feet. Is when I grew up, I know that was a river D in Scotland. You see, listen to Sparrow's Calypso. Dan is the man in the van. It's probably the most important Calypso for this discussion we're having here. The education system is dangerous. We have to start there because the minds of many generations of Tobagans and Trinidad and Caribbean people have been controlled and still being controlled. I know we're trying with curriculum and so on, but there are some very fundamental things that have not been taught. The way, the way we are taught here is not how they teach children in England and Canada and the States, and uh, Singapore and Finland and so on. So you have to start there. And if we, if we, if we try to tinker with other things, we leave in the root cause untouched. So you have to start on our education system, teach people to think, and then the minds will become enslaved. You see, the issue, as everybody said, is deep. Deep, deep, it's hundreds of years deep. Think of a big, think of that tree going up past me, and all the, the, um, the, the silk cotton tree. That hard to dig out. This thing deep. But we have to start because the education system we have is perpetuating it. Okay, so we have to really start there. We cannot ignore the history it happened. We could do something about it. And this is one forum to do something about it. We have to, we have to actually get back with each other here too, eh? Because some of us will not understand the real issues. So that is okay if you get back to each other. But let's start there. Thank you so much. Anyway, what, what I wanted to focus on um, is something that all the panelists have addressed, which is some of the psychological um, and emotional uh, consequences, um, repercussions of the enslavement of our, of our people. And these things are deep. Um, some of the examples that have been given, we all can, um, I think, repeat and, and speak of in our personal lives. However, um, I, I think that thinking of or looking at this question of the psychological impact of the enslavement of the African people on this part, in this part of the world has a, corral has a corollary um, to look at. And the corollary um, feature to look at is the economic system which brought us here. And the psychological issues, the mental slavery that Marcus Garvey and Bob Marley um, addressed and spoke about, I think is the obverse side of the enslavement of our people is the way to entrench and ingrain the economic system which holds us down, which has perpetuated, perpetuated and prolonged the enslavement of our people. However, having said that, I believe that for the four centuries and maybe more that we've been in this part of the world, we've been resisting. We never accepted our enslavement. 
we never accepted it on the economic se in the economic sense or in the physical sense or in the psychological and emotional sense. We've always been resisting and fighting back either individual acts of rebellion to wide-scale acts of rebellion as manifest, say, in Haiti or any of the other islands or even in the, any part of the Americas. So we've always been resisting. So I don't think we should lack or, or be uh, lacking in confidence because we fought back. We've always been fighting back. And I think that this is equally important to address as, as much as it's important to address psychological enslavement and mental slavery. It's also to say that our people have resisted and that resistance is manifest in Marcus Garvey's statement, in Bob Marley, in our art, in our music. Our music is Afrocentric. Our music upholds and sustains our being. So these are forms of like of rebellion. So yes, we should address the mental slavery. It's very important in education and in the society generally. But we should also, I think, recognize that um, we are fighting people. And our resistance has brought us to where we are today. I don't know if you'll allow me to speak in relation to the repair part of things, reparations. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Um, so if you look at the way I'm dressed, I work in a public um, agency. And I insist on the right to bear arms. Um, but I've taken the position that a lot of us have not, a lot of us have felt the damage that we speak of. And we are in need of a personal experience and a communal experience of repair and solidarity and our strength. So in my way, in every sphere that I can think of, I try to bring that forward and to point out to people that yes, reparations has happened to other groups of persons and that persons like Dr. Hilary Beckles has, have been able to achieve for us um, resources so that our institutions will be able to, in many different ways, express what would have happened if not. Um, on my Facebook page, I have only positive things, only African faces. Um, I think it's important for us to have each one of us a feel of what um, it is to be African and to feel our strength. And we, I want to posit that we are in that period, not just right now, where we are between emancipation and Carrie Festa, and they feel good that that was about, for 25,000 of us to come out last Friday at the closing ceremony tells me that we have this sense of solidarity and we have this sense of a different feel of our culture, of ourselves, our expressions of ourselves. And so um, I want to just put that on the table that we are living in an era of a move away from that burden, that jambi on our back, of, 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 of that weight of mental slavery and that there'll be nothing more beautiful than African people in the full flower and experience of our freedom. I want to agree with a number of things that have been said, certainly about the need for education. It's not only a question of African history, it's also a question of our history generally. I was astounded when I came in earlier to hear the young man at the registration desk say that he was only in his late 20s when he heard for the first time that there was a federation of the West Indies. Now, this is nothing short of scandalous. And if you don't know your history, you don't know where you are. If you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going. You're just moving, that's all. You're flying up and down the Claude Noel Highway, that's it. Some of them can't even read the signs. So education in any society is key. But I also would like us to, and the panelists, to try to place what we are saying this evening or what we are proposing this evening within the context not only of the reparations matter, and we might want to go into the question of what are reparations exactly? What is meant by the word reparations? But also, and I have not heard this mentioned for the evening, to my surprise, also the fact that this is the United Nations decade for people of African descent. 
five years nearly of this decade have gone, I have seen nothing in Trinidad and Tobago, nothing to suggest that black people live here. Nothing. The decade started at the beginning of 2015. 2016, so 2015, sorry. 15, yeah, 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, and we are nearly at the end of 2019. Has anyone heard of the decade of, you've heard of it? Have you done anything about it? Have you heard of black people in Tobago doing anything about it? I don't know how many black people have even heard about it. So nearly half of the decade has gone. And I would like the panelists, if I may suggest so, to suggest, and the audience as well, to suggest what they would like to see in the remaining five years of the decade, which is devoted by the United Nations to people of African descent. Not Africans in Africa, but the diaspora, including the Caribbean. Thank you. Um, my name is Irene Murray Prince. I want to thank, first of all, thank the Writers Guild because just as someone else said, these conversations are so critical. And the fact that there are so few on this island, we really appreciate and salute your efforts to make them happen in the first place, because they're really vital. Um, at the last session, when the topic was reparations, I um, had to leave, but before I left, I was able to ask, because half of that discourse was supposed to be about the repair. So uh, to the uh, sister's comments also, I would just like to know if in your deliberations and preparation for this evening, um, that was going to be part of the conversation because that's quite frankly what brought me out of my house. We, we've all, you know, to some extent we're a little bit preaching to the choir in that many of us have these feelings and these observations and know what we're talking about. However, the big issue for me is how, and that when I saw the title, None but ourselves can free our minds. That's the critical thing. I think, first of all, what happened to us uh, is so deep that it runs on all the levels, economic, social, psychic, spiritual, religious. So there's never going to be one prescription for healing. We have to address this on all the levels and the various bodies, disciplines, sectors, people, you know, we'll have to address each one, as well as all of us. But I'm particularly concerned with the fact that um, the work begun by Franz Fanon, I was very happy to hear you reference him, and Paulo Freire and others, um, and my concern is jo the work of Joy de Gruy. I never know when I'm pronouncing her name properly, but um, her work on the post-traumatic slave syndrome addresses this specifically. She's a psychologist by trade, and she has developed an entire healing prescriptive process for people of African descent to go through because until and unless we face the history, not just knowing it, you know, from an academic or an intellectual or even emotional, there are such deep psychic wounds. We have been traumatized, as um, Ms. Boris Phillips said. So there's a way to address trauma. And yes, we can all talk about the various manifestations of that trauma and we can remember them and recognize them, but we don't really deal with the prescription and that's what I would really love to see happen on this island all over the diaspora. That's why she did her work. There are others doing this work and I strongly suggest, I don't know, should we have a book club about it? Do we go through her book and look at her process? Do we look at others? But there is a way, there is a way through this trauma. And it is first and foremost to recognize that it is just like post-traumatic stress, it is trauma and there is a way through trauma that one 
must go through therapeutically. I think that's the work that Fanon began, and these others are, have tried to continue it, and it's really, um, it's healing. In fact, in her book, she refers to it, as there's the first section, and then there's the healing. So until and unless we go through that, I don't see that there will be answers for the bleach cream and the other scars and remnants of this trauma because they're so deeply ingrained and on so many levels that it comes out all the time in the dress code, in all kinds of things that people have mentioned, but all of it is all stemming from the trauma. And until we deal with that, um, I don't see it changing. And part of that, I'll just close with this, is you know, when um, Reginald, you talked, or somebody mentioned, it's not that we want to define ourselves by slavery, but because we know, um, Brother Opuku, our, our prior history as Africans, the glory of Africa. But I speak as an African raised in the United States and having Tobagonian ancestry and here now, it didn't matter that my parents had us reading all of this stuff, Basil Davidson's work, I know African history, I understood it, they took, they took their job seriously and educated us as to who we were. But you can't, even if you know where you came from, that's not necessarily prescriptive if there's been trauma. You know, I, we are all traumatized. So I and my siblings, we consider ourselves to be enlightened Africans, but we are deeply wounded. And it comes out in our behavior, our professional choices, our marriages, all kinds of things. So I just want to really stress that. And I'll just close with one quick illustration. Um, in her book, she talks about, and I know we've all experienced this, African people tend to be sometimes very harsh with their children. And she breaks it down in the simple fact that if you were a slave, and because of the rapes and because of the brutality, your child could at any time be sold, snatched, brutalized, you did not want to salute their independence or encourage them to be curious or encourage them to be, you know, in any way attractive to that type of terrorism. So we tended to be harsh and wanting to make sure that there were very strict boundaries, that they didn't pass them. Anyway, that's just one example, but I'm just giving an idea of how some of the things we see every day have their roots in that trauma. And we don't want to start with slavery, but it is a deep wound that we have to heal. Thank you. I think we must go back now to our two panelists. After they are presented, we'll still I think we still have time for a few more. So I will call on Mr. Pukuwari to make his uh, presentation. I, I um, wanted to focus on the glory, you know. Many, some of us who have been exposed to the knowledge of African history are uh, we, you know, we could boast about that, you know, that we know. But I want to say that um, as you move around, you know, because um, I went to the University of the People for how many years, you know? <laughs> as you move around, the brothers and sisters all around the island, you know, in the, in the, throughout the nation, and you deal with African people on a day-to-day -day basis, Let me give two examples. If you line up 20 people from any part of Tobago, and you line up 20 people from Penal or DB, 20 East Indians, they would know who they are. The Africans here might, the people here might say, well, no, me, I'm, I'm a Tobago, and I'm a, uh, you know. So we who may know must know that there are thousands out there who don't know. And that is why we have to keep up the work as basic as it may seem. Because we do not know, a lot of us didn't know, until 1970, I did not know about the glory of Africa, until I hear Geddes Granger, Makandal Daga, after his meeting in um, the car park, went to Mason Hall and talked about Africa being the light of the world and went into the, the, uh, the history and so on. And I want to point out to a brother in the audience here, Brother Dimas. For years, though, this man has lived a full life. He has gone through the public service and all that. But he takes up issues that affects the nation on his own and fight. 
on his own, and maybe spend his own mind battling issues that, in his view, are important for the nation and for our people to go, for we to go as a people. And that is a, the symbol, in my view, of the genetics of African resistance, so I want to commend them for that. You know, because we must know who we are. As Brother Kama was pointed, pointing, out about, uh, pointing out about the image of Jesus and all that, right? And, but we know that um, we, we, it was revealed to us that Jesus was in fact, in historical documents, a dark man with woolly hair. Jesus the Christ, just for Christopher, as the, as the Greeks called him. And we must know about our, our, the history of the, one of the greatest assets of the African is his spirituality. Forget all this nonsense about smart men who play obi man and obi woman. Nonsense. We must know that Africans would conceptualize their, their, the, the, the original forms of spirituality. For example, to be an African holy man, you have to study priest then. You have to study for 47 years. And they deal, dealt with not 10 commandments, but 147 negative laws of life. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do, do the other. But those truths of the existence of our people thousands and thousands of years ago, even before the birth of Christ, as we said before, have been hidden from us. But the, um, maybe the people in the Roman Catholic Church would know, the top men would know, because it was one church at one time formed in Ethiopia, Christi we're talking about the Christian church. The, the, the first Christian church was the Orthodox Church in Ethiopia, which the Romans break away and formed the Roman Catholic Church, and then the um, Northern Europeans break away from them and formed the Protestants and so on. So that, um, but the point I'm making is that the basis of spiritualism was started by the Africans. The, the Muslims and all the um, so on, they kept the, 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 those were late religions that came down. And it was Africans who had to translate scripts, Pant Pantheus and Buddhists who had to translate the, 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 the scripts for the uh, Muslims to write the holy book. So, so that the point is that at one point, Africa was the glory, was the shining light in the world. The first universities in the world were in Africa. Our, them brothers who shooting down one another. Some of them named Akhenaton, some of them named Akani. We're killing one another in Tran and Tobago. But, but how much of the history that they know, how much pride, because history gives you pride. But in order for you to develop the pride, it has to be taken from the, from the kindergarten stages, right through the primary stages into the secondary and into tertiary. So that we pe our people would grow with that sense of pride. But once you leave them believing that, you know, Africa is this poverty stricken place where white people used to eat up one another and all this kind of nonsense, they would never grow with a sense of pride. I mean, we were so far back in this thing. In that even when you take an African name, they, they make fun of you. Right? When we took our African names in the 70s, they make fun of you. What we got, we got, you know, and this kind of thing. That was how far, how backward we are as a people. But gradually, we are moving from point A to point B. So you might have a sister name, somebody might name the child Onika, another one would name Natasha and so on. All these little things help because in restoring the glory that was once Africa, and that is how you would emancipate yourself. When you understand who you are, we don't have to come with no fantastic or fantasy thesis to deal with emancipation. Emancipation is knowing who you are, recognizing yourself as a proud African, and being prepared to uh, project that in your daily lives. Basic things. Give yourself an African, your, if you do have an African name, give your child one. If you didn't give that child one and you get another child, give that child one. So gradually, over time, we move from point A to point B. Because what the kind of slavery that African went, Africans went through, chattel slavery. No other people in the history of humankind didn't go through that. Nobody didn't take away a name and give them name. 
Nobody didn't take away your former clothes and give you them clothes. Nobody didn't take away your concept of marriage, your concept of um, how you name your child and, and give you their own. Nobody didn't give, um, take away your religion and give you their own. No other people went through that. So we are coming from way, way back. So we can't study, like I hear some people who are talking about African consciousness and them think about African consciousness is cussing Indian. Nonsense! You have to learn from them because originally, in the glory days of Africa, Africans went across to India and taught the Indians. The river Ganges is named after the African general, General Ganges. Krishna means the black one. The, if you look at the basic structure of uh, Indian religion and Indian culture, you'll see the similarity with original African culture and, and, and so on, and spirituality. We taught the world. But, but we taught the world, but after a time, because of uh, the wars, the many wars we have to, to fight, we lost the glory of who we are. We were the first person who studied astrology. And there are some who say that we even connected to the, uh, the worlds out there. Because you can't tell me that we have millions of planets, billions of, uh, billions of galaxies, and we are the only place that are alive. So that um, in the glory days of Africa, L long before Europeans came, and don't get vexed, we even, we even taught the Europeans, we went to Spain and built the university in Spain, in Europe, in Salamanca, in Spain. And we went to England, September Severus went to England and cleaned out England, had to clean, build bridges and clean out the marshes and all, right? So that we came across to the Caribbean and helped the Incas, and they established the Inca and the Aztecs em empires long before Columbus. That is how great we are. And that is the greatness that they are not teaching our people. And that our leaders have betrayed us from since 1962 to now, but not having African history being taught in the schools. A few of us might know it. <laughs> brother Dimas and uh, Brother, I, saw, I think I saw Brother L Lincoln Warner here. These are men who have survived in this society by the skills and the talent that they, have, uh, that they possess and have reached heights of excellence. But if we want the masses of our people to reach heights of excellence, if we want the young men to put down the guns, we must give them the, that sense of who they are, that sense of glory and their possibilities, and open up their, the, creati the creative side of them. And then when we attain authority and power, share some of the wealth with them so that everybody could feel a part of the society. All that is part of emancipation. Remember before 1985, we didn't, we didn't supposed to celebrate emancipation. It was not a holiday. You know what we used to celebrate? Discovery Day. When Columbus, an ignorant white man, who didn't know east from west or north from south, went to North Africa, get some information, come over here. We used to and say he discovered down here and he met thousands of Afri um, um, people living down here. Right? And he was so wicked, they say in one instance, Columbus men massacred 15,000 Indians in Hispaniola, in um, the indigenous people in Hispaniola in one, in one day, and they said the Spaniards killed till their bones ached. You must read C.L.R. James, um, Black Jacobins. You know why you have to Black Jacobins track it down on your internet or whatever? Read C.L.R. James, Black Jacobins. Read um, this brother. Uh, from Guyana, Dr. Rodney Grongdon with my brothers. I read Chancellor Williams' destruction of black civilization to show the destruction on uh, yeah, how you are underdeveloped um, Africa. That is one item. But read Grongdon with my brothers because that is a basic one. Who, who you said wrote that one? Grongdon with my brothers, Dr. Walter Rodney. Oh, okay. And also read no. Chancellor Williams' the destruction of black civilization. Let me stop for a while. Right. Um. Right, as I said, in examining the um, title or the topic, None But Ourselves Can Free Our Minds, I looked at, at what, and I said, uh, you know, I asked myself, what does this statement mean? And um, for me, I, I thought that the statement implies that we are mentally imprisoned. Um, 
it also refers to the mind, and I thought that it refers to that which is associated with things such as thought, awareness, consciousness, perception, feelings, belief, memory, learning, cognition, and very importantly, the self. We are trapped, bound, and maybe even subjugated at the very core of our being. And it is a devalued state, and there's need for liberation. Right, and so that answered my what. I don't know if the audience agree with those um, analysis of the term, none but ourselves can free our minds. Right, um, and then I started to look at who, and my who, I started, to, I started off with who did such a, a statement originate from, and um, of course we know it was from Marcus Garvey, and um, made even more popular by musical icon Bob Marley. And this was in response to uh, what they saw as um, being a, a disadvantaged position that the black, black people, not just in the diaspora, but worldwide, faced. And um, it was a directive to black people to look beyond the physical um, enslavement and to also look at what the, the legacy and the mental impact that this experience has had on us as a people. Um, I, also, I also looked at, um, or I, I also asked the question, is this mental enslavement only experienced by the victim? Or is there a need for the perpetrator to also, or perpetrators, to also undergo a sort of catharsis as a result of being consumed by an ideology that makes slavery and racism pos possible. So there, to me, there is need for, um, if it's, I don't know if it's therapy or therapeutic uh, approach, or he, as the lady said, healing that must occur on both sides of the equation, right? Um, because it would have had an impact on those people who, who perpetrated it and their, their descendants. And I think that explains why we, in spite of all the knowledge and, and understanding that we have of what it is to be human beings, we are still plagued by the kinds of racist atrocities that we, we see and hear, whether um, locally or via the television abroad. So there is need for, um, for healing and for, for, um, for us to do some therapeutic work, not just among ourselves as, as the recipients, but among what has to be done with those persons who are descendants of the perpetrators. And I remember seeing on, um, I think it might have been CNN or one of those stations, um, channels, where um, someone talked about having um, an, a group experience where they, they spoke with, and I think it might have been females, white um, women who, um, the, whole, the whole experience and the discussion went to the point where they they got to um, a, an, you know, a, an apologetic and a recognition of the fact that they, um, even though it might have been their ancestors, they still benefit, and so therefore they felt that they needed to to um, to recognize the this, the illness of of slavery and to apologize on behalf of their forefathers. forefathers. So um, I'm you know I'm thinking that there is need for that. All right. Um, also recently um, via Facebook, the the popular um, social media, I read um, an article written by 
um, Rupa Shenoy and Shalaz, forgive me, eh, they're African names, but I, I can't call them all that well, Kove and Kove Siram, where they credited um, Nat Amatefu, historian and former mayor of Accra, Ghana, as suggesting that the, the existence of a state of denial within the Ghanaian psyche. He gave in historical accounts of how they contributed to the slave trade, whether purposefully or involuntarily, and the recognition of the horror and their sense of guilt made this part of their history that was hid hidden and, in a sense, rejected. And, you know, so it also uh, widens the, the narrative that we, um, that we are looking at where there, is, there has been psychological damage, not only in the diaspora, not only by the perpetrators who we see as um, the white um, slave, slavers, but also from whence um, our ancestors came, the process and the, and the experience there did leave a lasting legacy as well that has to be healed as well. And um, I want to bring to your attention that Ghana in 2019 has declared um, 2019 the year of return. It is a birthright journey home for the global African family. And um, persons have, all, um, have already started to take, take um, the opportunity to embark on this journey of healing. And I, I, you know, out of this, I, I, you know, we are not underplaying the value of what it means to, to connect and trace your heritage. Um, the, the slavers understood that, and, and they, that is one of the ways in which they controlled um, our ancestors by robbing them of that, 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 that connection and that, that, le that legacy with their heritage. So, you, you know, what it is to transport people from one existence that they've known all their lives to one that is so alien and they are so lost. You, so you have them in a place where you can do what you want with them. And that has been the, the history of what enslavement has been for our, our black ancestors who, who were brought from Africa and brought to the, the West Indies and the Western, um, the Western Hemisphere. And my question of, of why should we um, pay attention to this state, um, statement is because there continues to be disparities in the way society view people of color as opposed to white people. Um, in the writings of Franz Fanon, he says there's only one destiny for the black man and it is to be white. And he, this is explained in the sense that the dominance of the white culture makes it a natural desire and a natural stirring to be white, to live a white existence, to experience a life that is determined by white values. Right? And um, there is vested interest in, re in continuing these inequalities and as um, Laureen would have mentioned earlier in her um, statements, if we look at um, Williams' Capitalism and Slavery, he, he talks about the, the economic values that was achieved by um, the creation of, of slavery and enslaving black people for the length of time that, it, that um, they did. And do not um, think for one moment that those economic benefits stopped then, even though it, um, it was replaced by a new order, um, the order of industrialization. No, it hasn't. We are still, and well, in the replaced by, by colonialism, and, and then they went to globalization, and 
you know, and, and so we go from one world order to the next. But in every instance, we are at a disadvantage. And um, we, we are seeing the global events that um, are demonstrating and, you know, kind of, uh, my term is undisguising the prejudice and bigotry that, that, that has always been there as we look at um, anti-immigration, the, um, the new, the new um, well, they're saying it's a new um, world order of, um, what's the term right now? Um, whew, what's in Europe? I, 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 it, it slips me right now. No, no, not Brexit. The, 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 the order itself, the world order itself. It will come to me eventually. Right, and I want to also say to you that we, there is a strong case for us as the recipients to better narrate and as such challenge the story. And... Um, when I say that, it's, I, I, I am looking at the fact that between us, like intra-group intra dynamics, we are also applying the values that would have been imposed on us. There is such a thing as what um, they're um, popularly referring to as colorism, mm. where we value people of a lighter shade than people of a darker shade. And studies have shown that there are benefits, social benefits, that people um, get as a result of that. Economically, um, um, in terms of their, 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 um, their job description and their job status, they even mentioned that um, lighter skin women are, better, are quite likely to marry faster than darker skin women because they are valued more than, than darker skin women. And so there are social issues that we must be conscious of and work towards, I don't know if, we, if the word is eradicating, I, I, you know, because I am thinking in terms of my generation, it may not happen, but at least we should start to, to bring these, these issues to the fore and begin to see them for what they are and, and continue the discussions that we have prevailing now. Thank you. Now, Emil Durkheim, he defines education as what is passed on by the older generation to those not yet ready for life. What are we passing on? That is the first thing we have to think about. And if we are talking slavery, we must know that these people were sold as when you're going to sell your potatoes and so in Trinidad or wherever you're going. So if they drop off, if one was sold in St. Vincent. The other, your, the, the sister was sold in Guyana. The, the um, father was sold in Dominica. Careful, we're now marrying our relatives. You know? We are one family. And the thing with our thing here, the, the, um, in Montreal, Canada, February 11th, 1969. There's where black power started at Sir George Williams University. I was there. I was one of them. And the students who started that was from every island in the Caribbean, just standing up for their rights. They didn't go there to really mash up anything. But they were not given the right grades. And I want to say here that let your children go out and see life outside. Because Mr. Phillips has one called Pushpa. 
she is who have me pushing this youth group again, calling me, calling me night after night, start back YOT. I am saying here that there are so many persons from this YOT who are doctors in all parts, in England, in this, in New Zealand, in that. And I want to thank even Kamau, Laureen, and you, Deborah, because I know I will call on you all to come and assist, and you came. And I want to say here, we just finished Carrie Fister. We're coming out of it after. We're still going to talk about the Guyanese who come in here, and the sooner come in here, and the Vincent and sooner this. Let us try to come together as a people, knowing we are one family, and do not let politics and religion divide us. Because tell me how many of you sitting in here with all them education and all the things you're giving out on the boards of development in Tobago. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um. I don't like how all the young people running away, you know, like I shouldn't have said anything. I, I would have preferred to wait until I hear the young people myself. <laughs> I know, but they just scampering out. <laughs> but let me commend the, the guild for this very wonderful session this evening. And in particular, commend all the panelists and the moderator for a very enlightening set of presentations and thoughts. I'd like to make the point that this is a very big agenda we're talking about here, this business of emancipation. It started, as my friend pointed out, way back in slavery, in a system that was designed with many dimensions. Slavery had an economic side built on sugar and what have you. It had an oppressive side, of course, to support it in, the, in a sociology and a power structure. And we have to create a counter narrative to that. Emancipation, slavery in the mental sense, is a process of buying in to the norms and rules and so on that kept that system going and keeps it going to this day. And we have to create a counter narrative and be creative in building a new economy to reinforce our efforts at emancipation, a new sociology, much in, in line with what Opuko is saying, a new naming system, a new interpretation of color or for history, all of that. We need a new political system to facilitate the opportunities our people must have to practice emancipation by practicing democracy every day. Right now, we have an enslaving political system and so on. So this is a huge job, and it will take a concerted, concerted effort for a long time to fix it. But we must be very thoughtful in the way we interpret what we are in, in order to fix it. Thank you. I would start with the complexity of this topic that we have undertaken, or that we are engaged in here. Quite a complex topic. But I will turn now to hope. If there is any single island in the Caribbean that has hope of dealing successfully with this question of slavery and emancipation, it is Tobago. For the reasons we are behind the Trinidad Shield, we can do our thing. We are a small community. We can do our thing. We can come out to all the villages in a short space of time and do our thing. 
And the last but not least, this gentleman, and excuse me if I'm not good at names, you spoke of conditioning. If there is any place small enough to be conditioned, it is Tobago. The question of emancipation, and I will now use Attorney Alton Maddox, the chairman of the African Unity Movement in America, and I use the term attorney to get to the point, he points out that by the middle of the 18th century, yes, the British, the colonial forces knew that they had to emancipate the slave. Matter of process. We wouldn't talk about the Industrial Revolution that caused it and all the rest. But he points out that emancipation is a Roman word. It's not a British word. And so we have been imposed upon the Roman version of emancipation. In the Roman form of slavery, you could have been a banker, a doctor, and everything else. Look around us. Are we emancipated? We are in the Roman version, um, according to Dr. Alton Maddox, and let me say, the last research I did on him, he has been debarred. Remember? He, <laughs> he, he, was, uh, he was attorney Alton Maddox, who assisted Martin Luther King and all the rest, and is the chairman of the African Unity Movement in America. My last research indicated to me that he has been debarred. We are engaged on an interesting, very complicated, but hopeful topic. <coughs> we are in Tobago. We can do it if anywhere else can do it. Thank you so much. Good evening again to everyone. Um, I just wanted to add that what Apoku said and what uh, Miss Grace said and um, Kamau in terms of and this gentleman, the resistance, I think that you know the mental slavery could be deconstructed with positivity. It is good to have these forums that we say, you know, we, we elucidate history and let us know how great Africa is. But the positivity is what we must take of what our ancestors did, whether it be in dance, song, spirituality, and the like. And I, I, really, I really feel somewhat betrayed, as Opuku said, by our governments, that we have not used linkages from our African continents to really inspire and motivate us as a country. I look at the drips behind, and I see Africa, and I see Trinidad and Tobago, which signifies independence to me, which is, which is just a few days away. And when I look at how Jamaica celebrated their independence this year by inviting the president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta, to celebrate their independence in a national forum where he was able to talk and inspire so many Jamaicans who were able to hear him. And I, I feel betrayed that for our independence, we will have all those motorbikes that they just got on parade, and the horses, and the fire engines, and that kind of thing, and I will not be there. Because we have a fun and family day that we do in memory of our grandparents, my grandparents, that we are going to be having until the sun goes down. So I feel betrayed by our government that they cannot or they do not have these strong linkages with persons of African descent around the world, even from the diaspora, that could come to inspire us on independence. George Padmore, is heralded as the father of Pan-Africanism. He and Jomo Kenyatta, he was the one who 
included Jomo Kenyatta in Pan-Africanism, but yet Jamaica took Jomo Kenyatta's son to celebrate their independence, where they were able to show off, you know what they showed off? They didn't show off vehicles. They showed him the agricultural um, feats where they were able to show him the four breed of cattle that Jamaica developed through their own scientists. That is what they showed off. They didn't show off motorcycles and aeroplanes and helicopters. That's not what they did. They celebrated with having Cuban and Haitian dancers come and parade and dance in Jamaica. The band from Barbados was there celebrating with them what we do. What we do, we have an award ceremony that very few people go to, but it, it doesn't reach the masters. Only some people are invited. So we don't know who, you know, we don't have anybody to celebrate. We don't, we don't, we don't explore <coughs> linkages. And I think using our history to build, you know, to, to build and inspire and motivate persons could also deconstruct mental slavery. Thank you. Thank My name is George Bob. I must start by saying that I was most impressed by the, the presentation of Mr. Opukowari, really. The background, I thought, I thought he was the jewel in the crown of the palace we have here this afternoon. And I, <laughs> of course, I always believe our Calypsonians, who are poets and so on, and our people of literature, the people who generally have the foresight and observation you know, different civilizations, etc. They are ahead of us. As a matter of fact, it's Chalk. This is the first man who sang about repa re um, reparation, really, some time ago, when he talked about his grandfather's back pay. And of course, we heard about um, Crazy is the, the first man who, in time to come, who sang that about the first African president, etc. So the Calypsonians who are poets are the people with the foresight. They are people who are devotees of the life of the mind. And I want to congratulate him for his contribution this afternoon. I only want to ask him a question that has always puzzled me because he has this great background of African history. My question is, what were there to explain in the African situation the initial enslavement of so many for so long. Good afternoon. My name is Leroy George. Um, very recently, I read a book by John Gaffer Laguerre. And the title of that book was The General Elections of 1946 in Trinidad and Tobago. And in that book, he spoke about 1946 general elections, that was the first adult suffrage election. And so the people who would have made the legislature to determine who could join the electorate in that year, they had um, proposed that literacy be one of the prerequisites in joining the electorate. And the East Indian politicians, they were very enraged by this because in the East Indian community in 1946, literacy was not abundant. Now in that book, there was a statistical report made. And when I saw the statistical report, it shook me at my very core. And the shaking has not stopped. That's about a month now. Because what I saw, I saw that in that time, about 97% of whites in Trinidad and Tobago were literate. Now, by the way, I don't know what they determined is the level of being able to read that they would consider literate, but whatever level they had, 97% of whites were literate, about 93% of blacks were literate, about 85% of Syrians were literate, about 85% of Chinese were literate, and about 45% of East Indians were literate. So what shook me about that is I noticed that it appears as though we afro begonians are at or near the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. And I was wondering, why is that at all possible? Today, attending this forum here, whilst I cannot say that I've found all the facets to this multifaceted question that has been on my mind for the past month, a question did come to my mind that I think if I find the answer to, 
it would um, create a good lead towards figuring out why we are where we are right now. And that question is, what was the nature of the literature that my grandparents were exposed to? Was the literature such that it would have empowered them? Or was the literature such that it would create doubt as to the, who they were as black people? And that being said, I would like to suggest that if we as afro begonians would like to experience mental emancipation, it may have to start with the school syllabus. Thank you. So with that, I would ask perhaps Opuku to give us your final comments, but specifically if you'd answer the question, and if we could do that in about three to four minutes, each person, each of our panelists, and then we can repair to our homes. Thanks. Good. Um, well, in relation to the question, he wanted to know well, um, why um, the Africans, Africa was so, Africans were conquered in, a, in that kind of way. It was the question of power, uh, uh, gun power. When the, um, the Europeans went to China and, and, and found the, saw the Chinese do, using gunpowder for doing fireworks, and when they had the industrial revolution going on in Europe, they invented the gun. And the, the, with, with, with gunpowder, it gave them an advantage against the indigenous people of the world, whether it was the, the Native American um, or the, uh, the, the, the Africans or in India or in Australia. It gave them the advantage. Because remember, Australia was a black country too. No, never forget that. That was one of the first places that Africans went, Australia. Um, so it gave them the advantage. So gun power, and when you when you and then you remember to that Africa was a conquered nation. So when um, by conquering the people and setting up your system, the conqueror setting up their system, it made it made it more easier for them to control. It's just like when Hitler went into um, France or went into Poland and set up his thing. What what, what we just know what the only thing that Hitler did was to this. Weaken the British Empire so that people could have started the, the, the uh, demand freedom, but conquest, that was the reason why. I just want to summarize by saying that, um, that we had a spoken word, but I have a document I prepared here, the written word, that um, it, it is a basic document with certain information in relation to the matter we're talking about, um, the emancipation and the African Tobagonian, right? That is the title of the document. You could brother Eugene down there, he has come copies. So you could check him up. Just leave a small contribution and um, so that we could print more documents. And I just want to end by saying that one of the things I want to remember that Deborah Moore Miggins had joined me at a time when, when they had this heritage festival and they had the landing of the Colanders as part of the heritage festival event. Now the Colanders are a bunch of sea pirates and Deborah, Sister Deborah joined that attack and they eventually removed it from the heritage thing. Now, as long as we in Tobago continuing having this heritage with this Moriah people, this Moriah wedding, old time wedding, with people with top hat and scissors steel coat, those images are not good for us. That is that's enslaving your mind to the colonial master thing. And once we could have things like the French, somebody was up celebrating the French in we in Paldivia. The French were some of the most vicious colonialists in this country, right? The, the day who Sierra, I mean, students and they had to fight against in Haiti and run out of Haiti. So we have to ensure that when we're talking about heritage, festival and these things, that we have the correct images, we have the correct perspectives, we have the correct direction that could uplift the mind of the downtrodden African so that we could be powerful people and have a positivity about our lives. Thank you. So we have a little piece of item on the program, I'm just reminded. So we're going to make this summing up quite um, short so that we can take in the one or two items left. The thing is, when we were planning this, we Yes, when we were planning this, I'm using Mr. Wari's methodologies. When we were planning this, we recognized that this is a major, major topic. You, we cannot possibly 
cover everything in one session like this. In fact, this is a, a, a discussion that needs to be going on among our people for the next probably 100 years. You are not going to erase 300 and a half hundred years of damage, okay, in one discussion or in 10 years or in 20 years. There's no outer limit to how long this is going to take. But we have started it. We thank God that we have been inspired to start it, and we are going to continue it. Let me thank Ms. Um, Marie, um, because she told me about the John de Groot. I, I joy, and I googled it. It's this fantastic work she's doing with respect to post-slavery um, traumatic syndrome, and she has quite a few videos online that you can um, that you can we can look at. All right. One point I want to make in concluding is the fact that one of the things we suffer from as people of African of African descent is that we do not write and document things. We, everybody knows everything in our heads. That's how we feel. But we don't write anything. So I was really pleased to hear Mr. Opukuwari has written this document. The kind of knowledge he has in his head needs to be documented so that when he passes on, it is there. And somebody made that point, somebody made that point earlier. We are celebrating the, the decade for people of African descent. Is there any document in Tobago that tells us of the African businessmen that have existed in Tobago? We had a large history of, of, of business people in Tobago, you know. And it's not only George Leacock's father, but his mother was also, no, his mother was also a businesswoman. Anybody remember Miss Scoby with Blue Gardenia? Yeah. You remember Miss Blackman, Miss Parker, Rufus Phillips. Rufus Phillips. We have, and so where is the documentation? So you know, somebody came to me and said, "Well, you know, right, right, Susan Craig's work." So that we have to do more of that. We have to do more of recording what we are doing even now. So that in time to come, our young people, who will be big people then, will be able to say, well, okay, they did that, they did that. Let us move on to this, 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 and this. All right, but I have enjoyed this discussion. I have had a burning desire for a long time for us to start these conversations. All right, and I am so delighted. So people will stop asking me why I'm wearing my hair so. Why I'm not straightening it? Because it ain't fixed. Okay? <laughs> People will stop asking me that and come and have a good hairdresser I could carry you to. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, um, be before I go any further, just in response to um, the request for community um, involvement, our, our um, committee or team of um, planners always had community um, involvement and community outreach as part of what we are doing. And we would be very, very grateful if um, is Miss Miss Beach. Beach would um, assist us in getting those communities involved because we have tried, and it is a very difficult um, task to get them committed and, and 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 to participate in whatever ideas that we have. So, if you have that 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 unique touch and that um, familiarity, we would be so grateful because. Um, a lot of what we have um, would have had at the, the library here, we would definitely love to take, the, take it out into the communities as well. Okay? All right. So um, I would like to look at just briefly at how, um, and I would suggest that um, we recognize that legacy does not only mean burden, but can represent the passing on of knowledge and to, and to know it is better to know the knowledge on the passing on of knowledge and to know it is to be better prepared for the struggles and challenges. So each generation that follows needs to be informed and to be less vulnerable to the effects of the past and to be better able to nego negotiate any new challenges that arise. I would suggest that we practice as individuals um, to have self-affirmation and self-affirming ideas about ourselves so that we have positive notions and po positive images of ourselves so, um, so that we can better reject those that are negative. Uh -huh. 
um, in, what I think is imperative is the need to understand that it's not just an I at an individual level, but there are also social variables out there that come to bear on us and, um, and formulate how we see ourselves and see ourselves as a group, not, um, and, um, not just individually. I, before I, I, I close, I wanted to, to bring to your attention that in my reading that um, I read Franz, um, Fanon in his um, book, Black Skin, White Mask, and he said, um, black skin is felt as a stain. And you know, when I, I thought of a stain, how do we treat a stain? We view it as ugly, unsightly, disfiguring, and we seek to remove, wash out, bleach, or just discard. Mm -hmm. And you know, I thought those were quite, quite prophetic words. And we need to think about that as we go out the door. How do we view the black skin? Do we, do we see it as a, as a stain, as, a, a, you know, as something not, um, not worthy of valuing? How, how can we go about getting out of the state that we are in? I think the only answer to that is increasing the number of us who have what you call that critical consciousness. The number of us who understand that we are coming out of a situation of an inferiority complex, of seeing the world through the eyes, literally sometimes, of somebody else, a value system that has been imposed upon us. We could cause the education system from now till doomsday. If the teachers are not conscious, and we have a banking system that is geared towards putting information in your head that you could regurgitate in an exam, then nothing is going to change. You could cause the politicians, but if they are not self-aware, if they don't have critical consciousness, how do you expect them to change? We had a leader who was asked about wearing a dashiki on Emancipation Day, and he said, well, you want me to look like a mook? Yes, I remember. So, blaming them doesn't change anything, because they're not aware, they don't understand. We who understand have to work with our children and those who are close with us so that we can spread that consciousness. We have to develop that questioning in our, in our children as to their circumstances, their values. They must keep asking why. Why this? Why that? And we must try to help them to understand. That is where the willingness to learn the history will come. This is not teaching literacy. It is trying to develop that inquiring mind, that critical consciousness, trying to understand their circumstances. And out of that will come that thirst for knowledge, that inquiry, and that consciousness that will go. We have to do it ourselves. Yes. We can't look at an education and um, for us education system out there and say it will do it. It has not done it for the last hundred years. We have to do it. Thank you. But not only that, we need to encourage those of our children who are accomplished, not necessarily to come back home, although we'd be happy for that, but to make their skills and knowledge and talents perpetually available. And in this time, we have every distance is dead. We, we don't have that they could be wherever they are. But we feel them, and we know, and they guide us, and they, they interact, and inspire and up, uplift us. Don't let them just stay out there disconnected. They, we have to get them back into our bosom to join. And I'm happy to see Mr. Allard here. And all the young ones, they have to understand the, the, the burden, if you want to call it that, but the responsibility that is now being placed on them to educate themselves, as you have said, 
but not only to keep it for themselves, to share and to see as their role in parting and uplifting and, and feeling. It's not always their teaching. We can teach them too. They're not always in the dominance, but it's the interacting and demonstrating that they care that, that we're looking for. So those of us who have children out there, that is the message we have to send to them as well. That from birth it is necessary that you start the process of mental liberation. And that is that you can interact with your newborn um, in the, uh, where we begin to um, in, um, initiate the process of being loved, loved for who you are and fostering love of self. So you, 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 you make your little one know that she has beautiful hands, toes, you kiss them, they, she kisses her toes and, and, and so on. So those are ways in which you can begin from even then to, to ensure that your, your, your little one understands what it is to love who and who and what he or she is. So let us move on with the rest of the program, which is Mr. Walter Coppin. He will do a cultural item. Sanction or no sanction, Africa will never be conquered. It's 400 years now and over. All them superpowers trying to conquer Africa. Yes, they went down there with all the lust and the greed. But don't care how they try, still they can't succeed. Yes, they kill and they kill and keep killing. But the more African they kill, the more they see coming. And when they try and they try and they can't make hand with African, they just pack up the bag and back they go on to the land. Why? The more warriors they gun down is the more warriors will come. The more African that they kill is the more they see coming. Juju, Luru, Ashanti, what to see? Bacandela, Bacandela. The more African that they gone down. We get back Mozambique so easy Zimbabwe and Angola are ready And if it's one thing I show now as ever Namibia and South Africa round the corner Yes, it's one bomb they drop on Hiroshima And they get the whole of Japan to surrender And in 200 years red cloud on the reservation but for 400 years, they still can capture African. Why? The more warriors they come down, is the more warriors will come. The more Africans that they kill, is the more they see coming. The Juju, Yuhuru, Ashanti, what to see? Bacandela, Bacandela. The more Africans that they come down, They deal with Lumumba long ago. Yes, they deal with Boboya and Steve Biko. Yes, they keep killing leader after leader. But don't care how much they kill, Africans won't surrender. And how come these people want to tell me? Africa today have no unity. Well, I know they go say a junk, they go say I'm mad. But one day Africa go be living under one flag. Why? The more warriors they gun down, is the more warriors will come. The more Africans that they kill, is the more they see coming. The Juju, Yuhuru, 
Ashanti, what to see? Macandela, Macandela. The more warriors that they gone down. Yes, them have the bomb, them have the gun. Them making all the nuclear weapon. And if it's one thing I know that I could bet, Africa never invent no bomb as yet. So well, how come with all the bad, they bad? When they reach Africa, their weapon become a scrapyard. Like they don't believe the words of the old witch doctor. When he say that Africa will never be conquered Why? The more warriors they come down Is the more warriors will come The more Africans that they kill Is the more they see coming The Juju Yuru Ashanti What to see? Bacandela Bacandela The more Africans that they gone down More come, more come, more come.